Let's take a look at the Word of God. We're going to be looking at the book of Philemon. I suppose I could say it's 1st Philemon, chapter 1, but it's kind of superfluous for both of those because there isn't a 2nd Philemon and there is no chapter 2. Remarkable letter. Philemon, okay, it's Philemon, it's the whole thing. Let's hear God's word. Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldiers, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you I, Paul, an old man now, and a prisoner for Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, sends greetings to you, as does Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know of our need to understand how to live the relationships that we have, and we thank you for the way that you instruct us through your word. Give us confidence in your word for our ways in Christ. Amen. Well, this book of Philemon is a personal letter from Paul. There's some other personal letters. In fact, the three before this were 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, they're personal to Timothy. And Titus, Titus is also a pastor. And then there's this one. And really, 
Philemon is also one who works in the church. I mentioned before that 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus and now Philemon, uh, pastoral letters, they're really they're all three pastoral letters. They all have counsel for leadership. Philemon is a little bit different from the other two. The other two have requirements for elders and deacons and how to set things up. But this is a little different. Philemon is one who works with the church. The church meets at his house, but it's a very pointed letter about what Paul is saying to him. The letter has a direct purpose. Philemon is a man of some means. I mean, if the church is meeting in his house, it's got to have some size. That's the way this works. As one who has a large household, he has servants. And one of these servants, Onesimus, had run off. And he perhaps had taken something of value with him besides his service. Now, if caught, a runaway slave would be punished in some ways, perhaps even with death. So off goes Onesimus. And in his travels, he run into, runs into Christians. And he runs into Paul. And he becomes a Christian himself. And his heart is changed. And so he begins to minister to Paul in prison, which is something that was greatly needed. And... I'm not sure when he finally told Paul where he was from and what he was about, but Paul finds out he is a runaway slave and that he is a runaway bondservant of Philemon, who is somebody that Paul knows. And so he directs Onesimus to go back to Philemon his former master. And Paul is so confident that Philemon will restore him that he sends Onesimus with the letter. Here he is. In one way, this letter is quietly revolutionary. It is against slavery, servitude, in a quiet way quietly. In the world, in the church, there are those that have a lot and those that have a little. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because those who have a lot are able to do things for others. For example, Philemon has a place for everybody to meet. This morning we're talking about how Paul was invited to come to Lydia's house. Well, Lydia was a seller of purple. She wasn't poor, She wasn't a wearer of purple. She wasn't royal. She wasn't massively rich, but she had some things. People with funds are able to do things. But in the world, those who have money lord it over those who don't. And that's not how it is to be in the church. James speaks about this as well. What is he asking? What is Paul asking Philemon to do? Is the word manumit? Free. Free Onesimus. No longer consider him your bondservant. You now make him free. Now this is quietly revolutionary because he's saying that this man who is in your service is also a brother in Christ. And here's the principle that we can learn. We pray... Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And by debts, we mean sins, right? And debtors, those who sin against us. But there's an aspect where if you can forgive a debt, a monetary debt, and that would really bless that other person, that that's also a good thing to do. We're not here holding on to the last nickel. We are using what we have to bless other people. Now, sometimes you can forgive a debt and it's not going to help the person. It might actually hurt them. It may entrap them. That's a different story, but we'll get to that later. This letter really does have a lot to say about the topic of slavery. Our text correctly translates the Greek word 
doulos as bond servant. When we hear the word slavery, we think of what's called chattel slavery, where a person is not considered a person, but a thing. And that was, in many ways, the type of slavery we had in this country. People were viewed as chattel, as animals, and they weren't considered as human beings, weren't treated as human beings. Not universally, but quite a bit. And this is not here what Onesimus is. This sort of chattel slavery is dehumanizing, again, on the person. It's also dehumanizing on the person who treats that other person that way. This is like we had this morning. You get this, this crowd that looks at somebody and says, well, they're not even human. We're going to treat them like we wouldn't treat anybody else. That's dehumanizing to the people that they beat. But it's also dehumanizing to their own hearts. We don't want that in our own hearts either. Chattel slavery still exists in many places in the world. In fact, slavery, which was outlawed here 160 years, 70 years, however long it's been, right? It's probably more uh, used, there's probably more slavery now in the world than there was then in other places. It's a bad thing. The Old Testament had laws about slavery. Eh, slavery, bond servant is better because they had real rules. You couldn't mistreat them. In fact, if something happened and they got mistreated, they go free because you shouldn't treat them that way. And if a brother or sister, somebody else in, in Israel was said they can't pay their debts and they say, I will be your servant, it had a seven-year limit. And then they were free with the exception of some that would say, you know, you can set me free. I don't think I'm going to do better here. Can I just be here and work in your household? I'll be part of your household. And that they had a little mark there. They'd give a, I guess they'd give them an earring maybe. They'd pierce their ear. Uh, and they would, they would stay there. And why would they stay there? Because they like being there. It's a good thing. The Old Testament does not give instruction uh, to treat servants like they were property, or to treat them like human being. And there's people that slanderously say that about the Old Testament. Well, it's a manual on slavery. No. What we understand of slavery and what the Scripture speaks about with this uh, servanthood, and indentured servanthood, it's different. That said, let's give our attention to the text. It begins like any other letter that Paul writes. You know, it's like from Paul to so-and-so, Here's your greeting. It's Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, that's who it's from, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and some other people that, work, that are in the house there, Aphi, our sister, uh, Archippus, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in their house, and then that formula, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way Paul starts his letters. It's interesting to me, it's from Paul and Timothy. Paul is the apostle, and Timothy is, he's working in the apostolic uh, work as well. So people need to know that Timothy is someone that they need to listen to. And there's others with them all, but it's Paul. And he sends this. Um, it's interesting to me, too, that Paul here is not just a lone ranger, but he's working with others. And he's saying this not independently like this is my idea. He's saying this as an apostle in the church, working with the church. And by adding Timothy's name, Brother Timothy, letting people know that Timothy is someone that they should count on as well. Now often, and it's interesting, Paul will say, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He'll, he'll say that. And you think, well, that would make sense here because... He's speaking about Onesimus as a servant, a bond servant, but that's not what he says. What does he say? He says he is a prisoner, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He is in prison. He is faithful even into being in prison for Jesus. And this does play into the body of the letter. Paul is faithful 
And while Paul is in prison, we find out that Onesimus is ministering to Paul. And later in here, he says, essentially, well, you know, if he's, if he's your servant, surely you'd want him to be ministering to me because I know you really would want to care for me. And, and Philemon would. And in a sense, you've kind of been doing it by, by this guy here. Isn't that a good thing? Well, this letter goes to Philemon, who hosts the church, and it's also to others. Uh, Aphia may be Philemon's wife, Archippus, somebody else in the gospel, written to the whole congregation. I just say this to point out, it is a private letter to a person, but it's very public. And it's very public because of what he's asking. This is going to put more pressure on Philemon to make sure he does the right thing. This is not just for Philemon to look at and go, hmm, should I do this or not? No, the whole church needs to know, and we need to know it as well. And when Onesimus is received back into the church, they're going to say, you know, he's, he's not a bad guy. He's not a runaway slave. He's not somebody who we should call the law on. He is someone that has been forgiven. By the way, there's an application here for us. How often does somebody wrong someone else and then the Lord gives them both heart to for forgiveness and reconciliation? That's a wonderful thing. Sometimes this person will wrong this person here and all these people take notice and say, oh, can't believe this person did this over there. These two then will be reconciled and these people over here are going, oh, I can't believe that that's... Have you ever seen that happen? People who've taken up someone else's offense are slower to forgive and be reconciled to that person, and it wasn't their offense in the first place. Don't take someone else's offense into your heart. Listen, because there's concerns, but do what the scripture says. Tell that person to go and meet with this person that's offended them. See if this could be done between the two of them. If not, maybe somebody else can help another person, but it's not to be, you know, it says, go, go tell that person. It doesn't go say, tell all your friends and, and have them all go, yeah, that's really awful. That's not the way it works. You understand? It's the same thing here. They all need to know that Onesimus is forgiven completely. Now, the, it starts in here about the praise that Paul gives for Philemon talks about his love and faith in verses 4 through 7, especially about the way that Philemon demonstrates the love of Christ. Verse 4, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. What is Philemon's main purpose in life? He wants the church to grow. He wants people to be blessed. He is working for the gospel. He's working for the church itself. And that's the same calling that Paul had. He wants the gospel out. He wants the church to grow. Now, Philemon is not a traveling apostle. He's there in that church, and that's where he ministers. And Paul prays that Philemon would be effective. Verse 6, I pray that the sharing of your faith may be effective for the full knowledge of every good thing, that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now, what a prayer that is. You know, I pray that my ministry would be effective. Hearts would be changed. Minds would grow in Christ. I pray for the missionaries. I say the same thing, that the Lord would bless them, bless their work, and encourage their hearts. They need that. These are things that are important. May the people that ministers minister to Receive it as from the Lord. May they grow in the Lord. I pray for my own ministry. If you want to encourage your minister, pray for him. If you really want to encourage your minister, pray for him and tell him you're praying for him. God honors prayer. So Paul tells Philemon and the church that his heart just sings every time he thinks about Philemon. You know, I have derived much joy and comfort. We sang that, didn't we, about comfort and joy, comfort and joy. He gets joy and comfort. Comfort and joy, joy and comfort, through, from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Philemon's ministry is blessing that congregation. What a wonderful thing this is. 
Other preachers will come in. He will receive them in. These are good men preaching the word, fellow workers. Philemon's not an egomaniac like Diotrephes we read in, in 3 John where he's, he says, no, nobody else can preach here but me. Who are you? Get rid of these people. Don't listen to him. You listen to him, I'm throwing you out of the church. This is my church. No, 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 no. That's not Philemon. Here, there are precious souls, and as others come to encourage, he encourages them. And so the church grows in love. He acts like a shepherd, not like that other guy who acted like a wolf. He acts like someone who cares. Again, it's dangerous when a Christian leader tries to take over for the sake of his own ego because his ego can't save you or himself, right? Jesus is the key. And Philemon is a good shepherd. He's not like that. Now, Paul isn't just buttering up Philemon here, but he's recognizing and we recognize that Philemon is a true minister of the gospel who really cares about people. Verse 8 begins the body of the letter with the request that he has. Paul asks him, declare Onesimus as free. Forgive any outstanding debt and let him minister there with you. Let him join you there as a brother. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, points out 14 different arguments or reasons why Philemon should do this. There's not going to be a test, but I'm going to go through them quickly. Just so you can see all the ways that Paul does this. For one, it's the good thing that's in the Lord. In the Lord. Philemon does good things in the Lord. That's what we've already said, and this is a good thing, so he should. The second one is Paul could command him because Paul is an apostle and has the authority Verse 8 even says, although I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required, he doesn't do that because he has something else in mind. In fact, the point of love. This is number three. For love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. His love for Philemon, his love for Onesimus, he doesn't want to run over them. He wants to see the grace of God growing in them, that they would grow in love. By the way, it's good to allow other people to demonstrate love. It's a lot good to allow other people to demonstrate ministry, to do what they can do. Well, maybe they can't do it as well as someone else. And who can, right? We all do what we do, and that's how the church grows. That's how our hearts grow. Number four, an appeal from Paul, who has earned his hearing on, this hearing on two different grounds. He said, you really should listen to me, because one... I'm an old man. That was in our, our uh, reading this morning in Leviticus. The, the, you should give respect to the gray-haired, the older. That's part of what we do. And I'm a prisoner for Jesus Christ. There's another place where he says, look, I have the marks of the persecution of Jesus on my body. I'm not putting up with this foolishness anymore. Right? I'm in prison right now for this, and I'm not, I don't have patience with just silliness. We're getting down to this. Let's get down to the reality of what we need to talk about. You know, once you've been beaten, once you've been beaten for the sake of Jesus, we'll talk. That's what Paul says at one point. You need to respect that. And he has a point. The fifth, there's a special relationship between Paul and Onesimus. He's the son in the faith. Onesimus became a Christian under Paul, and there was that bond. Guess who else became a Christian under Paul? Philemon. So if Onesimus is my son in the Lord, and you're my son in the Lord, that makes you about, I guess you're you're brothers in the Lord, but they're brothers in the Lord because they're in the Lord themselves. Philemon should treat Onesimus as a brother. Verse 10, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. And he's special to Paul. That should make him special to Philemon. Number six, Paul appeals to Philemon's own interests. Onesimus had caused Philemon loss. But now he's in a position to have great gain from Onesimus. 
He's no longer a reluctant servant who might run away, might steal. Now he's a brother in Christ who is there to labor faithfully out of his heart. Philemon wants to bless the church. So does Onesimus. Bring him on. He's going to help all in blessing the church there. There's no way that the Onesimus of old could have done this because he wasn't a Christian. He didn't have the heart. He didn't have the training from Paul either. But now he can. Verse 11 says, Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's useful to you and to me. In other words, he ran off, but you know what? He's now become valuable to you in a way that he never was before. He is a blessing his running off turned out to be. It was wrong, but God makes it right. By the way, God will take things that are wrong, and he has some right purposes in it. Good purposes come from these things. Paul, number seven, Paul loves him. And anything that Paul loved, obviously Philemon should think highly of because he loves Paul too. I'm sending you back my very heart. Boy, you give something precious to someone, you want them to take care of it. Here's something very precious to me, Philemon. It's Onesimus. I want you to take care of it. It's a real benefit that, that he had there. Number eight, Paul is giving up something of value to himself by sending him. Because, verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment. Now, these days, if you get arrested, you are in jail or prison, and you get three hots in a cot. And there are programs for you, and there's medicine for you, and there's training things for you, and... People come in and even preach the, the word to you. Chaplains here are good. We pray for the, the chaplains here at the local regional jail. But back then, no, that's not the way it worked. If you wanted to make sure you had a loved one in prison, you want to make sure that they ate, you got food to them. If you wanted them to be cold, you know, warm, you got clothing to them. And there is a time when Paul's writing, and he says, it's, I'm cold. Can you send my cloak? Here, Onesimus was doing this, and Paul said, without him, I'm going to be missing somebody. And still, he doesn't order Philemon to, to receive Onesimus. He wants the opportunity to arise in Philemon's heart that he can demonstrate it. I preferred, verse 14, to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. He respects Philemon. What a joy that is. Number nine, if received back this way, Onesimus will never run off again. He has no need. He's there to work with you. He's there to be partnering with the gospel there. Verse 15, perhaps this is why he parted you for a while that you might have him back forever. Not just even forever here, but eternally forever because the bonds are not broken by death. Number 10, Onesimus, Onesimus is now better than a servant because he's a brother in Christ. Verse 16, no longer is a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, a beloved brother, especially to me. How much more to you, both in the flesh and the Lord? Number 11, the communion they have as saints. Verse 17, you consider me your partner? Uh-huh. Receive him as you'd receive me. Oh, Twelve, Paul would pay anything else he owes. If they're still worried that you're being cheated here, put it on my tab. And I love the way Paul says this too. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. It's like he's signing the IOU. And then he adds this. I will repay it to say nothing of you owing me your very self. In other words, your eternal life came from the gospel. And, and Philemon, where did you hear the gospel from? Oh, that's right, it was me. You look at me and you're thankful that God brought the gospel to you through me. In a sense, you owe me your very life because I brought the gospel to you. But never mind that. If, if you actually, he actually owes you something, I'll, I'll pay it off. Put it on my bill. For 13, Philemon was receiving Onesimus would bless Paul. Wouldn't you want to bless Paul? 
And he says, this would really bless me. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. I want some blessing from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart. And 14, the last one, and this is maybe, well, they're all really good. I have, I have confidence in you. Paul says, you should do this. I have full confidence in you. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing you'll do even more than what I say. And this goes back to the very first thing. I know you do the right thing. I know you do that. Paul knows Philemon's full of the Holy Spirit and of love. Paul knows that Philemon's judgment would be in line with the Holy Spirit and with love. Now, a lot of reasons. You don't have to remember them all. There's not going to be a quiz. But you do get this. He really lays it on heavy, and he's very, very thorough because he doesn't want to miss anything. And the reason for that is Onesimus is trusting Paul by going back because anything could happen. He might be put in jail. He might even be killed if that's something that that could be on the table. And so he has to show up. So Paul is making sure he's, he's being thorough in what he's saying. Paul wants Onesimus to live and to be a minister and to bless the church and to bless Philemon. And so he also wants the church to see this and to hear how important forgiveness is. This is a letter that publicly calls for Philemon to forgive a real debt, a monetary debt, an insult And this is something that's a witness to the church. Some of the important things, I think, for us to take from this. One is to free the servant, free the slave. This is a letter that's saying bondage is not good. Human bondage is not good. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul writes, everyone should remain in the condition in which they were when they became a Christian. Are you married? Stay married. If you're not married, maybe don't don't get married. Uh, He does say this, though. Were you a bondservant when called? Don't be concerned about it. In other words, you can still be a Christian. But then he adds this. If you can gain your freedom, do it. The, the, The scripture is about making people free. In Galatians 5, it says, it's for freedom you've been made free. Don't get caught into bondage again. He's talking about bondage into uh, slavery, into, for the sin, into sin. But in any kind of bondage, better to be free. But then Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7, he who called, was called in the Lord is a bondservant, is a free man in the Lord. If you're a bondservant, but you're called in the Lord, you're now free in the Lord. And he was free when called, is now a bondservant of Christ. We are servants of Christ. Then he says, you were were bought with a price. Don't become bondservants to men. You should be free. Others should be free. Christianity is against human bondage of any kind, especially uh, physical bonds, especially bonds to sin. I guess there's one bond that still exists. That's the continuing bond of love. We are to love one another and bond to Christ. And there's another application here that's really close to home. Forgive when you can forgive. Forgive. Maybe even let whatever debt goes. Let it go. Here's a case where the bondservant took something of value, and he is, comes back, and Philemon's getting along fine without him. Whatever it was he took, whatever it was, he's, he's okay. He can forgive him. How does a person get to be a bondservant back then? Generally, it's they can't pay their bills. They'll work for you. The master's got to pay off that debt while the person works it off. That's kind of the way it worked. So he was out. He was out of pocket after, after Onesimus ran away. And I'm not saying that if somebody steals from you, um, you continue to allow them to steal from you. That's not right. It's not good for them. 
it's not good for people to sin against you, steal, steal from you. It's not good for people to murder you either or to harm you in any way. Uh, don't set yourself up to be hurt that way because it hurts them to do it. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? You want them to do what's right. Don't make it easy for them to continue to do what's wrong. But most of the debts that we are called to forgive are not financial, and financial are maybe the easier ones. They're things that we hold, grudges that we hold. And in the end, what Philemon has to forgive is Onesimus' betrayal. And that's hard. But he didn't let it harden him. Of course, Philemon forgave him. That is, that is just so obvious. And it's obvious what we should do as well. I say this, forgiveness in the, in the kingdom of God, forgiveness is the coin of the realm. Forgiveness is what we do because forgiven is what we are. It doesn't, it doesn't get more basic than that in our Christian life and ethic. After the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, by the way, if you don't forgive other people, you won't be forgiven. So forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need to forgive. Many years ago, in a Mennonite dairy farm at the store, they had a little sticker on the wall. It looked like a bumper sticker. And honest to goodness, I've never seen it since. But it said this. Be like Jesus. Forgive someone today. Who needs forgiven? Who can you forgive? That's what Jesus does. That's what we do. Let's pray. Our Father, I ask that you would give us strong minds and tender hearts that we could take your word and apply it to our hearts and know how and when to forgive, to receive. And that as we do forgive and receive and restore, that this is used to turn the hearts of those who needed forgiveness to come to you and know that real forgiveness in Christ. That we would be a place of healing, that we would be people of healing. Lord, that you would provide the healing we need so that we are able to forgive. And the courage to forgive when we're called to do it. Lord, you've asked us, too, to ask for forgiveness. When we see that we have done something against a brother or sister, that even rather than come to worship, we should go back and make it right. And you've said, as far as it lies within us, live at peace with all men. Lord, thank you for your word which directs us towards freedom and love that we would be preserved from injuring others, manipulating others, and would be used to show your grace. We thank you for your word. Lord, move in us. Give us hearts that are so grateful for the forgiveness we have received that we have forgiveness to spare. And so show your heart of forgiveness that comes in Christ. And we pray this through Jesus, through whom we have forgiveness, restoration, and even comfort and joy.